Today we're working on a 2013 Chrysler Town Country with a 3.6 engine. Now what makes this video just a little bit different is the history. Now the customer that drives this vehicle all the time stated that every once in a while it runs rough, kind of like it's got a misfire. The problem seems to be intermittent too. I questioned him quite thoroughly about how and when it happens, what has happened, what he's done and so forth. And he usually says that it's pretty intermittent. Typically, it's usually right after he starts up, but sometimes it's even after he's driven for a while. Sometimes it's just while he's driving, and sometimes it's while he's idling. A couple of times he explained that it bucks and jerks so bad that he thinks it's going to die. He took the vehicle to a local shop, brought it in, told them the complaint. They tested it, and they first told him that it had two codes in it. PO300, random misfire, that makes sense, and a PO132, some type of an oxygen sensor problem. Now they took it for a road test and they could not duplicate the problem. And that is frustrating. We've all been there where the complaint is such and we just can't duplicate it. So anyway, they basically said, well, we don't know what to tell you. It's not doing it now. So they gave the vehicle back to him. So he decided to take it for a second opinion on a different shop, and this one's across town. Now I know both of these shops, and they're good shops. The guys do a good job of diagnosing. Anyway, they scanned it, came up with the same codes, PO300 and PO132. They took it for a test drive, checked it all over, and basically said the same thing. Well, we don't know what's causing it. We can't find any evidence of the problem yet. The vehicle's got 100,000 miles on it, and so they did suggest that they change the spark plugs because that could be it and that's a very good recommendation at 100,000 miles it needed new spark plugs. So they put it back together gave it to the customer and basically said the same thing I don't know what to tell you now because we can't duplicate the problem it's that intermittent. So the customer drove the car for quite a while after that the check engine light does come on and now he says every once in a while the check engine light will come on and flash at him and usually when that happens it's running real rough and almost wants to die. So anyway when the customer brought it to me I said okay I'll take a look at it but you're gonna have to leave it with me. I'm gonna have to drive it and I don't know how long I'm gonna have to drive it but I'll see if I can get it to do it and see if I can find out what the problem is. So that's the essence of this video. Now you all know that I emphasize critical thinking. It's so vital. Rather than just kind of running around blind, we've got to think about what we're doing. So let me tell you what I found and how I applied critical thinking to it. Now I took some notes on what I found, some of the details, so let me explain them. Yes, I scanned it just like they did and I came up with the same codes, PO300 and PO132. So when I reviewed the freeze frame, here's what I found. The RPM was 797, the vehicle speed was zero. So it was sitting there at idle. The engine coolant temperature was 208. So it had been running for a little bit, but wasn't fully warmed yet. So that again confirms to me that the problem's probably at idle or shortly right after startup. It was in closed loop. Now the other thing I looked at on here was the fuel trims. The short term fuel trim on bank one was minus 114 and the long term was minus 32.8. Now the short term on bank two was minus two and long term was minus 1.5. So it confirmed to me that our problem is only in bank one of this engine. Now while I was in my shop, I looked it all over. I sprayed water like we do trying to maybe make a spark or something misfire. I looked at all the potential vacuum lines. Anything that looked could be a problem, I didn't find anything. The vehicle is very, very clean. So I decided to take it for a test drive. Over the course of three days, I went on five test drives. The first test drive was kind of out in the country around here, not city driving, and but not real hilly either, just kind of where I could get up and do different speeds and everything. I went about 20 miles, nothing happened, ran perfect. My next test drive was about 30 miles. Now this one was in city stop and go traffic and some expressway where I could get up to speed, do some acceleration, deceleration and so forth and try and torque the engine. Still nothing, still no problem at all. It ran perfect. Now one thing I need to tell you, right now when I'm working on this, 
in the area that we are, we're in the upper 90s. I think every day it was 96, 97, 98 degrees. So the car is plenty hot. Now in this drive, I drove a lot of expressway driving and then I shifted back to city driving where I could just kind of drive slow and stop, set somewhere, light somewhere, set like you're at a drive up window or something like, different conditions. And still, it didn't do anything, it ran perfect. Now I'm sure if you were sitting here, you'd be about as frustrated as I was. Why can't we get this thing to act up? I've driven about a half a tank of gas out of this thing. Surely it would have done something by now. So again, I went back to the engine, lifted the hood, looked all around, tested the battery, all everything that you would test. I wiggled, I torqued the engine, I got on the hood and bounced it up and down, tried to see if I could move the motor mounts. Anything that I could try and do to make it have a problem, nothing happened. It ran perfect the whole time. So I go back to my shop and this time I'm going to take another test drive. I'm going to show you what I did on this test drive because we did find the problem. Okay, it's time to go. You know, we have a lot of sophisticated equipment these days, and it's good. We should use it. I use it. But sometimes our best tool is our critical thinking. So that's what I did with this vehicle. Basically diagnosed it while in the driver's seat the whole time, finally getting the problem to happen, and then look at the data and review it and think it through. So here's what I found. Now I use the Snap-on Varus, and it has a special feature of taking pictures so I can just reach down there whenever I'm feeling something or I want to know what data is going on at the time. Push the button and it'll take a snapshot of what's on the screen at the time. I'm going to show you those some of those as we go. Rather than just show three days of road test data, I'll show you the screen captures. But first, let me ask you this. Remember the codes? Which code should we focus on first? We should first focus on whichever code was stored first. Remember, it's intermittent. Now, codes tend to stack up. There's usually a cause code followed by one or more symptom codes, but they are all listed together. So we should first focus on whichever code was stored first. And to do that, clear the codes and see which one comes back first. So our codes were PO132 and PO300. Now we're going to clear them, but I want to see if those codes come back and which one first. And how am I going to try and find them? Well, I'm going to use the scanner and look for which cylinder is misfiring. So before I start the engine, I'm going to bring up the screen with my misfire counts. And you'll see that cylinders 1, 3, and 5 on the left have zero counts, and 2, 4, and 6 on the right have zero counts. Now it's time to go for a road test. Now this is what I saw when the problem finally occurred. It wasn't instant. Now remember I explained earlier how much road testing I had to do and sometimes intermittents require a lot of patience. Notice that bank 1 on the left, cylinders 1, 3, and 5 all have over 100 misfire counts out of 231 revolutions. And bank 2 on the right, cylinders 2, 4, and 6 have 0 out of the same 231 revolutions. Now this does not tell me what the problem is but it does tell me that whatever it is, it's affecting only bank one. So I can rule out things that would affect both banks equally. Now remember, this is scanner data. I'm still sitting behind the wheel. So what should I look for next? Coils? Although it is possible, it's not likely that all three coils on only one bank would have the same identical misfire counts because they're all driven by their own driver or controller. Now the same holds true for the injectors, right? They each have their own driver. So still thinking about what would affect only one bank but all the cylinders in it equally and remembering the code PO132, well there is only one upstream oxygen sensor on each bank and that sensor is feeding back data for the PCM to calculate air fuel mixture for that bank, right? So I decided to see what the O2 sensor is doing. Before we take a look at live data, take a look at this screenshot. Now remember I said I diagnosed all this while sitting in the driver's seat. Notice there are nine graphs, so obviously this is not a lab scope waveform. 
Instead, it is scanner data plotted as a graph. What does scanner data plotted as a graph mean? It is data that the PCM is using and letting us see it. It is not live data. It is process data. To see actual live data, you would need a lab scope, and it is truly live and unprocessed. An oxygen sensor live data on a one-channel scope would look like this, and it can be sampled at a speed of 1 million samples per second. Scanner data is processed or averaged, and depending on how many data PIDs you are watching at the same time, it will be sampled at a much slower speed. Processing takes time. I selected nine screens at first, but to simplify, increase the processing time, and to keep this video a little shorter, I reduced it down to just two PIDs or data screens. The O2 Bank 2 Sensor 1 on the top and the O2 Bank 1 Sensor 1 on the bottom. Now as we know, the screen reads live from the right edge and then you have your trailing history going over to the left. Now we're currently reading 0.78 on Bank 2 Sensor 1 and then you have your Min Max feature over on the left. So we're on bank 2 sensor 1 the minimum is 0 0.04 and it's switching to 0 0.9 so it is switching I'm not sure if that's normal but it is switching now look at bank 1 sensor 1 on the trailing edge on the, on the leading edge we're reading 0 0.0 now our min max over here is 0 0.0 to 1 wait a minute 0 0.18 well it is switching but it looks more like a square wave why can't this be a square wave because we're reading voltage. An oxygen sensor is a voltage generator. It makes its own voltage. A square wave is a voltage interrupter. It blocks voltage to make a digital switching signal. But remember, we're reading voltage here. So right away, something doesn't look right to me. Let's take a look at this a little bit deeper. Now, as I do that, I want to set this thing in motion. So let's start it live. Now as you see again we're reading from the right edge. Now remember I said the bottom kind of looked like a square wave? Well look at that bottom. It does look like a square wave. It's not. But look at the top. Every time the bottom looks like a square so does the top. Except the top is switching in between the two squares. So as we continue to watch I know something's not right but I don't have enough information to make a decision yet. So let's just keep watching. Now, scanners and lab scopes are good for catching glitches, but sometimes, like in this case, if we got such an intermittent problem, we really need to watch this over time. So as I'm watching this, my bottom score wave seemed to have somewhat of a pattern to it, except as I'm watching now, that interval seems to be widening. The bottom one is switching, and then the top one seems to be switching a whole lot normally. And then suddenly the bottom one went right flat to zero. And then the bottom will start switching. Now it's starting to look kind of erratic. And the bottom one looks like it's pegging out close to one bolt the whole time. So something's affecting both of them. Now for your information, at this time I noticed the symptoms. We started running rough. Again, we're at idle, but the engine is running very rough at this time. There's a lot can be learned by watching these waveforms over time. So as we continue to watch this, the top one is very, very rich. It's kind of pegged out. And the bottom one is very erratic. Now you know the computer is a logic device. Its job here is to balance the air-fuel mixture. And it's supposed to do that logically. But I think the computer is probably looking at this and saying, I know I'm supposed to balance fuel, but what am I supposed to do with that? I can't make sense of that. It's not normal. It's not what I was expecting. And I can't use it to make calculations. So I'm going to let that driver know we got a problem. I'm going to turn on the check engine light and see if we can't get some help. So I'm seeing a lot of erratic activity on Bank 1 Sensor 1 O2. The Bank 2 seems to be switching and a lot closer to normal, but it's still not right. So I have enough evidence that go hand in hand with my symptoms. The engine runs perfect most of the time, but then it starts running bad. And at that time, 
the bank one sensor one O2 sensor becomes very erratic. So I have symptoms, intermittent and random misfires, and I have evidence, an O2 sensor circuit high signal that is erratic. The symptoms match the evidence. So my recommendation is to replace both upstream O2 sensors because they are both original with the same amount of aging and miles. Now one last note, keep in mind, I did all of this from the driver's seat with the scanner, but it was the understanding of how the systems work and using critical thinking to put it all together.